Well, officially, good morning, everybody. I met many of you, if not all of you, most of you, I think, as uh, we were coming in today. Uh, But it's a joy to be here with you. And I'm thankful that you are here. I'm thankful that we are gathered together in this place this morning to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that you have prioritized this uh, as part of your life and as part of your testimony. So thank you for being here today. I'm also thankful for your pastor uh, reaching out to ask me to fill in for him this morning. Thankful for him and for his family and for him entrusting me to be here today. I am representing... As Ryan said this morning, my friends and family over at First Baptist Litchfield. Is it okay for someone that lives in Litchfield to be here this morning? Is that okay with you all? Okay, okay. It's all right then. That's fine. Um, But I am missing my church family, but rejoicing to be here with you today. Isn't that how it is when you're away from your church family? You, You are family and you miss them when you are not there, but I rejoice in being here today partnering with you here at New Harvest. That's a beautiful picture of the church that uh, brothers and sisters in Christ can join together, help one another, and minister together. That's what we're called to do, right? That's what we're called to do. So thank you, church, for your welcoming spirit, your smiling faces, many of you smiling faces, uh, and, and the stories that I've already heard, the connections that that we had that I didn't even know. So it's a joy to be with you today. Some of you may be wondering, who is this guy? Like, who is this guy up here behind the pulpit? Uh, His face is non-recognizable, and that's a good thing. But I want to tell you just a little bit about me. First, I want to say my fan club of two people, they did arrive in droves today. Uh, So it has upped your attendance a little bit. My wife, Sarah, is here with me. I really had to talk her into this, you know. But my wife, Sarah, is here. My mother surprised uh, us today as well. My mother, Mary, is here as well. Uh, My name is Dennis Cook or Colt or whatever Ryan said it was earlier. I'll answer really to anything. It really doesn't matter. Um, I am the pastor of worship and discipleship at First Baptist in Litchfield. We've been there about 11 years now, serving full-time, serving the Lord, and as He uh, is leading us, there, God called my wife and Sarah and three, my wife Sarah and three kids to Grayson County. We've been faithfully serving Him as He leads us. But believe it or not, I grew up just 16 miles down the road, right off of Highway 505 and Horse Branch. So I'm kind of a local anyway, and I ended up serving very close to where I was raised. I grew up in Beaver Dam, so I am an Ohio County boy, but uh, thankful to serve in Grayson County. I earned my undergraduate degree from Kentucky Wesleyan in Owensboro, got a master's degree from Campbellsville, and a master's degree from Liberty University. Um, But enough about me. Out in the community, you may have seen my wife, recognized her for a couple years. She owned the Cook Ranch Shaved Ice uh, little food truck that went around town. So that was her uh, as spreading cheer through sweets. So uh, you may recognize her. She, She works at Head Start now. Uh, in Litchfield. This is uh, my second time in this sanctuary. Uh, Back in 2015, a couple of you have slept since then, but 2015, I brought our choir out for Christmas one year. We did our cantata, and we had so much fun here worshiping with you all. So thanks for allowing me to be back with you to study God's Word together. When Pastor Richard asked me to fill in for him, I, I, I like to ask this question. What are you going to preach on? You know, what are you going through something as a church that I can continue? Or do you want me to preach a standalone message? What works best for your church, your people, in the season that you are in? And, and based off the sign, he was correct. You have been walking through the book of Acts for quite some time now, and he asked me to continue that. So I invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to Acts chapter 26. We'll continue walking through the book today as we look at Acts chapter 26, beginning with verse 1, when Paul gives 
his defense before King Agrippa. I appreciate uh, Aiden reading the scripture passage right before I came up. First off, isn't it awesome to have youth leadership in worship and youth serving God in his church? It's a great thing. So thank you to, to him for that. But it was a great lead in to what we'll be talking about today. And a brief summary from chapter 1 in Acts until now, and I'm talking brief. The gospel was being made known in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the Gentiles, to Asia, to Europe, and to Rome. It's the Great Commission in action, right? This is what the book of Acts has been all about. This trial with Paul and King Agrippa was presented to us in Acts 9 that the apostle would appear before the Gentiles, kings, and the sons of Israel. This, and you know, I, I kind of hate to, to steal the thunder in a way, but some call Acts chapter 26 the culmination of the book of Acts. So you guys have been walking through this with your pastor for so long, and I get to kind of take the cake. I get the dessert, the best part of, of the book in a way. But what led us to this trial? What led Paul to this moment in life when he was on trial in front of King Agrippa? and others. One of the commentaries that I read uh, studying this message breaks it down plainly. The Sanhedrin wanted to kill Paul because he preached that Jesus rose from the grave. Two years before that, they tried to have Paul killed in Acts 23. When their plans fell through, they tried to convince the governor to execute him. They couldn't, they couldn't charge him with anything. The charges were unprovable. They kept him in custody. Two years later, they tried again in Acts 25. Paul appealed to Caesar. Later in Acts 25, Festus sent Paul to Rome. There were no charges, so King Agrippa is now involved. That's the Cliff Notes version, right? Leading us to where we are. King Agrippa and other leaders hear Paul's story and help him determine what, if any, crime Paul has committed. So I'm going to read our passage of Scripture today, Acts 26, beginning with verse number 1. Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and began his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially since you are very knowledgeable about all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. All the Jews know my way of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own people. And in Jerusalem, they've known me for a long time. If they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand on trial because of the hope in what God promised to our ancestors, the promise our twelve tribes hope to reach as they earnestly serve Him night and day. King Agrippa, I am being accused by the Jews because of this hope. Why do any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? In fact, I myself was convinced that it was necessary to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I actually did this in Jerusalem, and I locked up many of the saints in prison since I had received authority for that from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I was in agreement against them. In all the synagogues, I often punished them, and tried to make them blaspheme. Since I was terribly enraged at them, I pursued them even to foreign cities. I was traveling to Damascus under these circumstances with authority and commission from the chief priest. King Agrippa, while on the road at midday, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice speaking to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. I asked, who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. But get up, stand on your feet. 
For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So, then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Instead, I preached to those in Damascus first, and to those in Jerusalem and in all the regions of Judea, and to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and were trying to kill me. To this very day, I've had help from God. And I stand and testify to both small and great, saying nothing other than what the prophets and Moses said would take place, that the Messiah must suffer, and that as the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. Church, Let's pray together this morning. Father God, we give you glory for this day. We give you glory for who you are and the great things that you have done for us. We rejoice as a church family this morning, giving you praise, God, for the blessings that you show us. Forgive us of uh, the blessings that you show us that we don't recognize and thank you for. Help us not to take this time for granted today as we worship you, as we Open up your word and study your word and apply it to our lives. We thank you for your living, breathing word, a word that can equip us to do your work and the word that can bring salvation to the lost. So today, God, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Help me to decrease, help me to increase you and you alone. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. My sermon title today, we've read the whole thing. You all could probably come up with this same title. It's really rocket science, okay? Paul's self-defense. Paul's self-defense. A question for you today. Have you ever been on trial? Well, don't raise your hand. That may be embarrassing to you. Just think about this, right? Have you ever been on trial? Chances are probably not. But a better question might be, have you ever felt like you were on trial? You know, sometimes in our relationships, we find ourselves accused of something we have done or not done, and we're called to the carpet to answer for ourselves. I may be alone here. Some of the the men may be too afraid to raise their hand and relate to me on this one. But I was once on trial for loading the dishwasher improperly. No men are laughing. They all put their head down and were embarrassed that I brought it up. That's right. Believe it or not, there is a proper way to load said dishwasher. It's not enough to take the dirty dishes from the sink in an act of service to the household to load the dishes up however you see fit for them to get clean because you load them up, you close the dishwasher, you hit go, and they get cleaned. No, there is a standard, a proper way of loading dishes into the dishwasher. And I was on trial. And I was found guilty I've never lived that down, have I, babe? You still mad? I think she's still mad. No, that was a tongue-in-cheek analogy, of course, but Paul had his hands full in a very serious situation with the law. It was captivating, and if you think about it, and this is the plot of every TV show or movie, right? Someone has lied. Someone stretched the truth. There's a crooked leader somewhere, and they're tangling a web of deceit. One thing leads to another, and you're watching it unfold. 
That's what we find here. The amazing part of this story is that there were no clear charges to have Paul arrested and be on trial in the first place. Maybe you remember this. I think you talked about it last week. Look back at Acts 25. Turn the the page back to Acts 25 and start at verse 24. Then Festus said, King Agrippa and all men present with us, you see this man. The whole Jewish community has appealed to me concerning him, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he should not live any longer. I found that he had not done anything deserving of death, but when he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. And I have nothing definite to write to my Lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after this examination is over, I may have something to write. For it seems unreasonable to me to send a prisoner without indicating the charges against him. Hmm. Instead of being innocent until proven guilty, Paul was guilty until proven innocent. You see any recollections and association between that and the story of our Savior? In Paul's self-defense, we will find four points that will equip us to share our story for the sake of the gospel, just like Paul did. Four points that will help us share our story when it's time for us to speak for the sake of the gospel, just like Paul did. Point number one. Point number one, Paul understood his task. Paul understood his task. Look again at the first few verses of chapter 26. We're back in chapter 26, verse 1. Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and began his defense. He said, I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am able to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially since you are very knowledgeable about all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Paul understood his task, waiting for his turn to speak. The king said, you have permission to speak for yourself. And even before Paul uttered the first words of his opening statements, he stretched out his hand as a sign of respect. Paul understood where he was. He understood who he was speaking to and how to treat the king. Moreover, Paul understood that in order for the king to be open to hearing and understanding Paul's perspective, respect must be shown. It would be like, you talking to your spouse or a close friend and you are sharing your heart, you are sharing your heart's desire and you are going deep about your relationship with them or something that is troubling you and they are focused on watching Looney Tunes on the television and nodding their head. That's not respect, right? But Paul knew. He understood the task at hand. All of Paul's attention and focus was on the king. In fact, Paul knew that this was his moment, that the king would be soon hearing about the king of all kings. And in order to make sure King Agrippa's heart was open, Paul showed him the respect he deserved. Not only did he stretch out his hand, he then complimented the king, counting himself fortunate for the opportunity to speak to King Agrippa. Now, isn't that a great tool to use? Respect, compliment. That's a good thing to remember if you're ever on trial. Paul wasn't defensive as if he were trying to hide something. No, it was just the opposite. He was living in the moment, standing firmly on the footing of the Holy Spirit who had led him to that place in that time, in that moment, guiding his every phrase. Paul goes on to affirm the king's knowledge about Jewish customs and ask the king for his full attention. Patrick Schreiner wrote, Paul is truly happy to present this case because Agrippa is knowledgeable enough to decide the dispute. Paul has another opportunity to witness. Paul knew the task at hand. Next point, number two. 
Paul addressed the main issue. Paul knew the task at hand, and then he addressed the main issue. Much like the decorated law official Barney Fife, who always chose to nip it, that's right, nip it in the bud, Paul knew there was an elephant in the room. Somebody explain that to the younger kids in here, the whole Barney Fife thing. He knew to address the main issue, the elephant in the room. In fact, if you're on the horse, you might as well ride it. You might as well take advantage of the moment that you've been given. He knows that his Jewish background is in question and that he is on trial because he believed God raises from the dead. Let's see how Paul addresses the main issue. In chapter 26, look at verse 4. All the Jews know my way of life from my youth which was spent from the beginning among my own people and in Jerusalem. They've known me for a long time, if they're willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand on trial because of the hope in what God promised to our ancestors. The promise our twelve tribes hope to reach as they earnestly serve Him day and night, King Agrippa, I am being accused by the Jews because of this hope. Why do you, any of you, consider it incredible that God raises the dead? John Pohill wrote, John had emphasized the Jewish hope in the resurrection. Throughout Acts, you guys know this, you've been walking through this week by week. Throughout Acts, the hope of the Jews, the resurrection and the Messiah are all of one piece. Jesus' resurrection is depicted as proof of His messianic status. Jesus' coming as Messiah is presented as the fulfillment of Israel's hope, the fulfillment of God's promise to the nation. The resurrection is the main theme of his self-defense thesis. He wanted the king to understand and leave with the power of the resurrection as Paul shared and poured out from his heart. In other words, Paul is defending his life by saying his background as Jewish links to the Old Testament prophets and the promises by the death and resurrection of Christ. They are indeed the fulfillment of Jewish beliefs. Look at verse 8 again. Why do any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? Paul point blank asks the court. He addressed the main issue. He point blank asks the court and the supporters with the question with evidence from his own life. He supports the question with evidence from his own life. Verse 9, in fact, I myself was convinced that it was necessary to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus. I actually did this in Jerusalem. I locked up many of the saints in prison since I have received authority for that from the chief priests. Many chief priests were in the room. They were just like, ugh, don't use our name. When they were put to death, I was in agreement against them in all the synagogues. I often punished them and tried to make them blaspheme. Since I was terribly enraged at them, I pursued them even to foreign cities. Foreshadowing with his testimony, Paul was setting the stage for the main part of his testimony. Within these verses, Paul was giving the king the platform for a miraculous understanding of the miracle that God did in his own life. Paul was once convinced to do things in opposition of Jesus. He locked up the saints. He encouraged the killing of them and pushed them out of their cities. Listen to this. Paul wanted Agrippa to know that if anything or anyone could transform him from being the chief persecutor of Christianity to its chief advocate, it would have to be miraculous. Paul understood his task. Paul addressed the main issue. And point number three, Paul shared the truth. Paul shared the truth with a capital T. 
Look again, beginning with verse 12. I was traveling, this is a familiar story, right? I was traveling to Damascus under these circumstances with authority and a commission from the chief priest. King Agrippa, while on the road at midday, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice speaking to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads, meaning it's useless for you to fight against me. I asked, who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. But get up. Stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul was sharing the truth about the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus had met him on the road to Damascus. That happens three times in God's Word. Three different accounts, right? He met him on the road to Damascus and turned his life around completely. In this conversion, Jesus did three things to Paul. In that road to Damascus meeting, Jesus did three things to Paul. Point A, Jesus revealed Himself in Paul's path. Jesus revealed Himself in Paul's path. Verse 13, while on the road at midday, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus revealed Himself in Paul's path. Can you imagine Jesus appearing before you in a light so bright you cannot see? It's blinding. i got to admit something to you. These glasses are not just for show. Not just to make me completely handsome. Without these glasses... Everything is a blur. I mean, without these glasses, I am just walking around like this. I'm basically a blind man. Can you imagine Jesus appearing before you in that way? We pray for the presence of God, but what if His presence actually appeared in a light brighter than the sun and blinded us? Jesus got Paul's attention. He revealed Himself in Paul's Path, point B, Jesus renewed Paul's purpose. Jesus renewed Paul's purpose. Verse 16, but get up. Stand on your feet. For I've appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I mean, I just, that's the sermon in all of our lives, right? Let me just get out of the way of that. What is the purpose of Jesus coming to turn Paul's life around completely? Paul is giving his testimony here, and this is a major part, right? It's the turning point of who Paul was and who God was going to make him into be. No longer was Paul going to be the one who persecuted Christians. Instead, he would win them for the Lord. Jesus revealed Himself in Paul's path. He renewed Paul's purpose. And point C, Jesus reset Paul's passion. A lot going on here when Jesus meets you. He reset Paul's passion. Mid-verse 17 says... I am sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God and they may receive forgiveness of sins and share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Jesus not only reclaimed Paul, 
But he also commissioned him. He charged him to spread the news of his resurrection to Jews and Gentiles and to bring them to understanding so that they would turn from darkness to light, that they would be released from the power of Satan and they would receive the forgiveness of sin and have place among those who are sanctified by faith in Jesus. Paul understood his task. He addressed the main issue. He nipped it in the bud. He shared the truth with a capital T. And finally, point number four, Paul showed his loyalty. Paul showed his loyalty beginning in verse 19. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Instead, I preached to those in Damascus first and to those in Jerusalem and in all the region of Judea to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and were trying to kill me. As Paul wraps up his powerful testimonial account of the transformation God did in his life, he basically looks at the king and says this, What would you expect? What would you expect me to do? I met Jesus on the road. Did you just think that I would be like, Nah, I'm good. Did you expect me to tell the Creator of heaven and earth, no? How'd that work out with people in the past, laughing at God, disobeying Him? How'd that work out? So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Paul was loyal, and he followed his orders. So in that moment, what did Paul do exactly? In verse 20, instead I preached to those in Damascus first and to those in Jerusalem. Why did Paul do it? So that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. What was the result of Paul following God? Verse 21, for this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and were trying to kill me. What was Paul's response to the Jews? Verse 22, to this very day I've had help from God. And I stand and testify to both small and great. Remember, it's not just the king in that room. There's others. To testify to both small and great, saying nothing other than what the prophets and Moses said would take place, that the Messiah would suffer. And that, as the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people. And to the Gentiles, Paul immediately began showing his loyalty to Jesus by preaching that the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, should turn from their wicked ways toward God and seek repentance. That's why in verse 21, the Jews, he said, tried to kill him. Pastor that I follow and learned a lot from and grow in my personal discipleship walk in. Pastor Tony Evans out of Dallas, Texas, wrote this out of his um, commentary. Paul highlighted the heart of the gospel, the suffering of the Messiah, his resurrection from the dead, and the proclamation in his name of light and forgiveness to the Jews and the Gentiles alike. He highlighted the heart of of the gospel. Paul's focus was sharing the gospel with the audience of a king. That was his task. He addressed the issues at hand, he shared the truth, and he displayed his loyalty to the Lord while doing so. That was a successful self-defense. But though he was defending himself in turn while on trial, what he was really doing was making a case for Calvary. You may be saying to yourself, hey, that's a great account in the life of Paul. Very trying time in his life. That's a good story. 
Be careful saying the word story when we talk about the accounts of the living, breathing Word of God. These are factual events. He was making a case for Calvary. What's that have to do with you? What does that have to do with me? Remember today, Paul has given us four points. And in those four points, what he has provided is an evangelistic template for us to share our story. Using this template, we, like Paul, can testify and share our story. When we testify, here are some application points for us. When we testify, we point one, we share who we were. We share who we were. In the first part of his self-defense, Paul was telling King Agrippa who he was. Right? He shared about his Jewish roots since he was young. And I lived as a Pharisee. They've known me for a long time, right? He was sharing about who he was. It's important when we share our story that people understand who we were. Those who are lost need to understand when we testify, when we testify about our Savior, as Paul did with the king, that we're not peering down our noses at them. We're connecting with them. Because we have been where they are. We're sharing who we were. That we too once were lost, but now we are found. We were what? Blind. But now we see. We share who we were. Application point number two, we share how Christ changed us. When we testify, we share who we were and we share how Christ changed us. Changed us. In the middle section of Paul's self defense, he shared that his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus changed his life. It was a life changing account where Jesus changed Paul's life completely. Those of us who are Christians have that same story. No, we may not have that road to Damascus in our life, but we were blinded by our sin. We were made to see our sinful ways, and Christ changed us forever through His love, grace, and mercy. There's no little change when Christ comes into your life. There's nothing little about the transformative power of Jesus. When we testify to others, we share how Christ changed us. Charles Spurgeon wrote, I can relate to this one personally, When a blind person stands with his face in the darkness, if he goes forward, he advances into a blacker night. Right? It's just another step. It's just more darkness. How necessary is that the work of the blessed Spirit by which people are turned completely around and their direction is reversed? We share who we were. We share how Christ changed us. And finally, application point number three, we give our testimony to others when we share who we are now. Who we were, how Christ changed us. This is what Paul did. It's a template for us. And who we are now. In verses 19 through 23, Paul gives the power behind the purpose of his defense. The story is okay so far. We once were this way, exhibit A. Christ came into our lives, exhibit B. And now this is who we are. I rest my case. Paul put the final argument of his case, beginning with verse 22. To this very day I have had help from God, and I stand and testify to both small and great, saying nothing other than what the prophets and Moses said would take place, that the Messiah would suffer, and that as the first to rise from the dead, He would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. It's not enough to share about who we were. It's not just enough to say we encountered Jesus We share we were lost and that Christ came into our lives and completely changed us from the left to the right. Have you ever turned your life around completely? If you're a Christian, you have. It's not easy. There are ups and downs. Discipleship 
is the rep, generational replication of Jesus. It's a process, generation by generation, we're passing down the truth, and each one of us through spiritual disciplines are attempting to chisel ourselves more and more into Christ's likeness, but we're not perfect at it. I know how it feels to turn your life around in more ways than one. Last year, my health had been faltering little by little. Well, lot by lot. I was in the worst shape of my life. My back had five bulging discs. The pain from the discs impinging on my nerves was unbearable most of the time. That's my wife. About month four or five into it, she's like, okay, we get it. We've got to do something. Maybe you've been there. After a successful back surgery for me, I began a weight loss journey based off of the example of my bride who was doing the plan. It took everything I had to stay committed to it. Even to this day, she tempts me with cake all the time. It's true. But it took everything I have and still have to stay committed to turn my health around. People who knew me before, they they knew who I was. But they knew what God did in me, and they know how He's changed me today. And it's similar to our walk with Christ. He does the same for each one of us as He did for Paul that day. We all have our Damascus Road experience. Those of us who knew the Lord, we all were once sinners. And through the Holy Spirit, our sin was revealed to us, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible teaches us that sin is a pathway to death. Romans 6.23 teaches us about the consequences of that sin. For the wages of sin is what? Death. The punishment that we have earned for our sins is death, not just physical death, but an eternal death in hell. But here comes the good news. Romans 5.8 declares, But God demonstrates His own love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ died for us. Jesus' death paid the price for our sin. And His resurrection proves that God accepted Jesus' death as the payment for all of our sins. Because of the Father's love for us, through the death, the burial, and resurrection of His Son, He has made a way for us to live with Him forever in heaven. Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Because of Jesus' death on our behalf, the Gospel, Jesus dying in our place, All we have to do is believe in Him. Trusting His death as the payment for our sins and we will be saved. Romans 10, 13 gives us this assurance for all who call on the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. All who call upon His name. Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sin and rescue us from eternal death. Salvation... The forgiveness of sins is available to anyone who will trust in Jesus Christ. Once we give our hearts and lives to Christ, Romans 5.1 assures us, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation in God through Jesus is the truth, with a capital T, Paul testified about in his own life. He shared that with the king. It's the same truth that you have today if you do not know the Lord. Another truth that we have today is that one day we will all stand trial for our own lives. Our life was an account of how we lived for Christ or was it an account of how we lived for self? The Bible says that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that what? Jesus Christ is Lord. When you stand before the Lord and give your defense, will you be guilty of loving and living for Him or guilty of denying Him as your Savior and Lord? The choice 
is yours to make. The opportunity, though, is yours to claim. Salvation has been offered to you freely through grace, and all you must do is confess and believe in Jesus. To do that today would be a showing of the evidence of your past and the exhibits of your sins. that They can be washed away whiter than snow. What a powerful way to end the case today. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the truth from your word. I thank you for this church and every person that is here today, every person hearing this message. Thank you for empowering us and equipping us with these truths, Father, and how the truth of the life of Paul and how you turned his life around as an example for us to share our testimony with others about how you've done the same with us. But if someone does not know you today as Lord and Savior, they have a decision to be made. Maybe some have a decision to recommit their lives. Maybe some need to come to the altar and pray this morning. Maybe some need to pray and seek growth in their discipleship walk. We thank you for an opportunity to respond to this message and to our time together. We thank you for forgiveness brought through Calvary. I pray, God, that your Spirit leads those who are struggling to make a decision today to step out in faith and accept you as Lord and Savior, to step out today and publicly make a change for you. Forgive us as, as we come to you today. Forgive us of our sins. Help us to seek your Spirit in this time this morning. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I'll be down front this morning for a time of response. There are others, though, in this room who are also willing to pray for you and with you. Maybe you'd like to, to go to them and seek them in prayer. Maybe you'd just like to come to the altar today and pray. Whatever the case may be, the altar is open. This is your time of response to respond to the Lord for who He is and what He has done. Let's stand together as we have our time of response.